Happy Sunday, everyone. It's good to be back together with you today for more in this new series, I Think, I Feel, I Am. We're so glad you're joining in and believe that God has some really important things for us in this series. The world we live in and just our own lives in general can tell us a lot of things that influence the way we think and then the way we feel and then ultimately how we see ourselves. And when the world and our own thinking is what's governing all of that, we can go to some pretty dark places. But we've been created by God who has some things to say about you and me, about how our identity can and should be found in Him, our Creator, about how who He is and what He's done should be what forms how we think and then how we feel and then who we conclude we are. It's easy to let other things inform that. So I'm glad we're taking the time here over this series to really remind ourselves of what is true as we consider how we think, feel, and see ourselves. I'm glad to be a part and glad to be joining with you. As we head over, be sure to let us know how we can be praying for you if you'd like to join with someone this morning, and then I will see you all in just a bit. Good morning, Christ Chapel. My name is Brooke, and I have the privilege of serving on staff with our young adults here at the Fort Worth campus. And it's my privilege to welcome you in this morning. When you walked in, you might've noticed that the great room looks a little different. <laughs> um, and that is because we are working hard to refresh the paint and the carpet and the restrooms. And so thank you for being patient and bearing with us. Um, it will be worth it. And I know that it will not make worship any less sweet. Um, if you're new, I want to extend a special welcome to you. Thank you for being here and giving us your Sunday morning. I hope and pray that it's a blessing to you. Um, and if you're new and want to know how um, you can take more steps with Christ Chapel and get more plugged in and let us introduce ourselves to you, you can do that by filling this out. This is a Connect card, and you'll see it in the seat back in front of you. So if you fill it out, we will reach out to you this week with more information. You'll also see a card just like this in the seat back in front of you. This is our prayer card. We are a church that deeply and fully believes in the power of prayer. It is an honor and a privilege to pray for and with you. And so if there's something we can partner with you in prayer in, you can fill this out. Um, and after the service today, you can drop either of these cards off in the offering box. And if you're joining us online, you'll see a link in the chat to fill either one of those out. Um, one of my favorite things we do here at Christ Chapel is we have a time of elder prayer and that's coming up on May 19th. Um, this is a time for you to come and gather and be prayed, prayed over by our elders for healing and encouragement. And so if that's something that would minister to your soul and be a blessing to you, be sure to check out our events page for more information. Um, church, like I said, I'm glad you're here. We're gonna have a sweet morning of worship. So let's start our time together by standing and greeting those around us. so good to be together. Will you worship with us? Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my foe. You are my portion, you are my hiding place, oh, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, I believe you are the way, the truth, 
Teach a, teach a new song, um, sing a new song with you, sorry about that. We wanna sing a new song together that's called Jesus We Love You. And this song just gives us an opportunity for us to just recount God's faithfulness, to thank Him for what He's done in our lives. And just for us to simply say, God, for that, for who you are, um, we devote our lives to you, we love you. Before we do that, I just wanna read a psalm for us from Psalm 95, it says, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are also his. The sea is, it's, the sea is his for he made it. And his hands form the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker for he is our God. So church, as we sing this new song together. Let us just look at our own lives and, uh, and see where God has been faithful and just thank him for that. And also in return say, God, for who you are, purely alone, we devote our lives to you. Let's sing this together.
for redeeming us and making us new. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, Christ Chapel. Good to be with you this morning. I want to continue in worship, and we're going to do that through giving. We want that to be simple for you, so you can text the uh, keyword that's up there on the screen to that number. You can go to our website. There's some boxes out there. You can drop a physical offering in it. But I want to point out, I'm still kind of amazed that summer is almost here. It's around the corner. And for us, that means one thing. That means kids camp. Kids camp is coming. It's huge. This is a week that draws tons of kids. A lot of them go to Christ Chapel. But we, we draw a lot of kids who don't go to church at all on Sundays. And uh, it's an awesome opportunity because they come together and there's just so much love and enthusiasm. There's creative games, there's snacks and snacks and snacks. And they, my, my kids love snacks. There are all sorts of great things going on, but most importantly, the gospel is shared in the most clear, compelling and loving ways. In fact, uh, two of our three kids came to Christ at kids camp. 
No, they, I did not influence them at all. It was just kids camp, apparently. Uh, it's near and dear to our hearts. It's in a very effective uh, place for evangelism and just the love of Christ to be lifted up. So uh, you don't want to miss out on this because this is a great and easy way to volunteer and be involved in frontline evangelism missions work, in, if you will, just right in our own backyard because a lot of these kids don't know Christ. And so you can be involved and um, these, uh, these kids, they need you involved. I'll just say it that way. And there's, if, if you're interested in learning more, you could visit our website. There's a, an, an events page and that's up and, and you can learn more about that or you can just go ahead and sign up. I wanna encourage you to do the latter. Um, last week, Cody started, he kicked off our new series about emotions and he led off with a feeling that we're all intimately acquainted with, unfortunately, it's called anxiety. He talked about anxiety and anxiety it's closely related to what Ben is gonna talk about today, but anxiety is a generalized fear, this sense that something is going to go wrong, but you're not exactly sure what it is. And it just forms this undertone in our life, almost as if like the Jaws theme were playing in the background, right? Dun, 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 dun. For those of you under 30. Um, it is something that it can rob us of joy and peace because we suspect that the problems around the corner might be above our pay grade. We might not be prepared to face what's coming and it leaves us just generally worried. And it's a real problem because the problems might be real. The threats might be real, but it's a problem on the one hand, but it's also an opportunity on the other hand because we face big problems in life, but we have a bigger God. Our anxiety can remind us of who we have to go to in our anxiety. We have a God that says, you're anxious, come to me. Don't try to carry that on your own, bring it to me, I've got your back. That's straight from Philippians 4, the RMV, the Ryan McCarthy version. Philippians 4 verses 4 through 7 is going to be what we use as a kind of prayer prompt in our time together because it's the easiest thing to just obey what it says and pray our anxieties. So would you bow your heads with me? Philippians 4, 4, and Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, will I, I will say rejoice. Let's start by praising God for who he is, whether you feel it right now or not. Praise him for his wisdom his power, tell him how good, gracious, and loving he is. Just spend time praising him and rejoicing in him. Paul goes on to say, the Lord is at hand. The NIV actually says the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. What are you anxious about this morning? What's occupying your thoughts or distracting you? God has invited you to bring it straight to him. So let's do that. In light of Iran's attacks on Israel and the dramatic escalations that are happening in the Middle East, would you just take this request to God, ask him for his supernatural protection and peace to do only what he can do? Another thing you might be anxious about or distracted by is undealt with sin in your life. Fortunately, we have a God who has given us forgiveness and provision in Christ. We can freely confess to him. So take some time to confess your sin to, to your loving God. We're told to bring our requests with thanksgiving, thanking God in advance because he's gonna answer. He always does. 
So just take a moment to express your gratitude to him. Father, thank you for inviting us to come to you in our anxiety with our cares and concerns. It comforts us to remember how great you are, that you know us, that you care about us, that you're with us. And I pray that we might experience what you promised in Philippians 4, 7. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. Morning, Christ Chapel. How are you? Good, good. So glad you're here. So honored to get to preach God's word with you. We are going to be in Mark chapter 4. So uh, go ahead and start uh, flipping there. Mark chapter 4 is page 839. If you got one of those uh, Bibles in your seat, um, like I know um, all the venues just spent some time praying for Israel. Um, I stayed up way too late last night reading stories and watching statements from Israeli officials or or news reporters and and reading articles on what's going on in the world. If if you woke up to that or if you went to bed with that, uh, we as a church have to continue to pray. And we have to continue to pray for Israel. We have to continue to pray for uh, the Middle East. Now all of those nations in conflict, at war, the, the evil that's there, we need to pray for protection. Ultimately, we need to pray that Jesus would do what only he could do. Not just in peace in, in that place, but also uh, changing people's hearts, changing everyone's hearts, uh, changing all of those nations that they would, they would see him. Um, we're talking about fear uh, this morning, and, and I think it's appropriate in just if you pay attention to the news, whether it was this weekend or last weekend, I'm going to be honest, whether you're paying attention next weekend, there will always be something in our news, in our life, on our social media feed, in our own hearts that's going to produce this feeling and this emotion of fear. Last week, we talked about anxiety, um, and we, we walked through what it looks like to take anxiety that gets disordered and get it in a biblical order. Um, and this week, we'll step into fear. And those two are, are really similar. Uh, they're really similar emotions. The best way I could distinguish them for, for uh, the sake of time is anxiety is, is the, the storm on the horizon, right? Anxiety is when we look in the distance, and it's our head that says, what if? What if that storm on the horizon heads this way? What if I get swept up in that? And it's, it's that what if question. And fear is really we are in the middle of the storm. And the, the question that we ask when we're feeling the fear uh, and the emotion of fear is, is not just the what if, it's the is this it? Is this it? Am I going to get out of this? Is this ever going to relent? And so that's really where we're at. Um, not just asking the what if anxiety question, but the, it's here. And the storms are in our life. And we, so many of us, are in those storms and find ourselves in those storms this morning. So I'm glad you're here and I'm glad to get into God's word to see what it looks like to order that properly. God created emotion. He created emotion. It's his design uh, and yet so often how we respond can be unhealthy. It can be in unbiblical ways, but if we really study God's word, we can see what 
what it looks like to order it properly. So let's jump into Mark chapter 4. We've got a lot to cover. Uh, We're going to be in verse 35 through 41. Picks up in verse 35. It says, On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with them. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's unpack this story. There's a ton here. And we see this literal storm that the disciples are in. And we see uh, their navigating of of valid fear and how that valid fear kind of knocks them off of course. Uh, These, some observations from the text that we know, these, many of the men in that boat, many of the disciples are professional fishermen, right? This is what they do. The boating life is not a a new thing for them, right? They they would have encountered tons of storms. And so we know this is unprecedented, right? This is an unprecedented storm because all of them are are worried. Um, We also see in this passage that, and there's this desperation, their fear in this unprecedented storm, it, it has these layers to it. And one of them is a desperation. They go and wake up Jesus, right? They, they go and into the stern of the, the ship where he's sleeping and they wake him up. And there's a whole nother observation that I don't have time for in this sermon, just about the hypostatic union of Jesus here, right? The, the hypostatic union that Jesus is fully God and fully man, both of those things. And here we, ha- we see in this passage, Jesus whose words control creation and nature, the, the power of God in, in Jesus. But also simultaneously, we see in this passage a man who's clearly exhausted. I mean, he is, he is wiped. His, his bodily flesh is exhausted. He is asleep in a boat in, in typhoon weather. Uh, something else we'll see, though, is this emotional response of fear. We see this abandonment. Right? There's a desperation, obviously, in the disciples, but also an abandonment that, that shows up in their fear. They're saying, God, do you even care? Right? It sounds almost accusatory. How could you, how could you still be asleep? How could you ignore us? How, how could you abandon us? Right? You don't get it. He's asleep on a cushion. Do you not care? Is, is what the disciples say to Jesus as they wake him up. And I think if we sit with the story a little longer... And we marinate, we also see this whole other layer to fear, and, and that's the defeatedness, right? The, the fear, I mean, they, they're not waking him up so that he can help. They are waking him up. They're already resigned that they are perishing, it, it says. That's, they're saying, hey, it's, it's too late. I can't believe you didn't care. We're already perishing. They've resolved that they're defeated. They're frustrated. There's a, there's a sarcasm and a tone in the disciples' And then Jesus wakes up, he flexes, and the storm turns off. The storm turns off, he, the power and the authority of Jesus on display in the middle of the sea, and then he turns to the disciples and he, and he rebukes them, uh, he, he, he questions their faith. And, and another observation in this text, um, it's so rich, this is chapter 4, right before this, Right before this, uh, this story, they were on the other side, and Jesus was telling the parables. And right before they get in the boat, he's telling them the parable of the mustard seed. And, and all you need is just a little bit of faith. And it's, he's teaching these parables, and he's helping them understand the power of faith. And then that very night, uh, they, they don't have enough faith to, to understand that who's in the boat with them is more powerful than the storm. How about us? Right? When, I, when I think about fear, and I think about how pervasive it is in our life, I, I see the disciples here in the story, and I, I see their reaction to the storm they're in. I think it's appropriate for us to look at ourselves. And so throughout this, I, I want us to look at ourselves and evaluate ourselves through the lens of God's word. Storms in our life, they produce fears in our life, right? Those circumstances around you, 
uh, externally are going to have a huge internal impact in, in our life and our emotions. And those emotions can have such an impact on our thoughts, right? And our thoughts start to become disordered and we start to lose hope and we start to be discouraged and we start to be defeated. And, and then those have such an impact on how we see ourselves. So much of this series that we're in now is, is really a look at those things, how we can get it backwards and how it can even start to shape our identity in ways that God didn't design for it to do. And so for, fears and and storms, they're real, right? They are very real, and they're personal, right? It could be health. It could be a health of loved ones that you're in, feel like in a storm. Not just the what if on the horizon, but you're in it now. It could be job. It could be career. Um, it could be relationships that you're in that feel frayed. It, it, could, be, um, it could be a lack of relationships, right? It could, it could be a relationship that's dissolved or that you can't find and it's frustrating and it's, it's scary. Um, man, I am, personally, I'm raising two boys and they're incredible boys, but I'm, I'm raising them in a, in a culture that scares me, right? A culture that it, we'll just be watching a cartoon and all of a sudden I'll just hear lies come through the TV. And I'll think, what, how am I navigating this in the life of a seven-year-old? What is still to come in this culture? How bad is it going to get? I, I, I get resolved to just say, it's too late, right? It's all gone. And there's no hope. I mean, there are all these personal fears. So how do we respond to that emotion of fear properly? I want to first show you two default ways that we respond, right? There's, there's these two default responses that um, uh, I, th I think it's important to look at, right? They're not a biblical way to respond, but they're very natural. And the first is that uh, fear of the storm, right? What happens when the storm hits is the fear of the storm, it can lead us to try to control what we're not designed to control. And so when we find ourselves in the storm, so often that becomes the initial foundational response, I'm going to take control of this situation, right? And, and that control can show up in a couple of different ways that are problematic. One, uh, when I'm experiencing a storm, right, that my, that my initial primary reaction is to grasp at anything I can, right? Grasp at anything I can to, to control so that I can make myself feel better because the feeling of fear is a really uncomfortable fear, and so whatever I have to do to grasp control so that I hopefully don't have to feel this feeling is so often our instinct, right? And here's what I'm doing in that moment. When I do that and when we do that, what we're doing is um, we're looking for a savior, right? Because of how uncomfortable that feeling is, I'm looking for a savior to get me out of that. And what I'm really doing is I'm saying I'm going to be my own savior, right? That's what's happening in those moments is I'll control my own. I will... Maybe I have the power to stop this storm. And I'm going to do whatever I can to stop this storm. I'm sure the disciples started there, right? Um, they, they can't control the storm. But I would assume as fishermen, they can control a boat. They're grabbing the sails. They're grabbing the, the wheel. They're, they're forcing the rudder one way and then the other. They're grabbing buckets as it's filling up. Right? Those actions aren't wrong. It's not wrong to react with, with actions to help solve problems, right? I'm sure it was intuitive for them as fishermen in the sea, and here comes a storm, the boat's filling up. The boat's filling up. You better grab a bucket. If there's a storm in your life, you, you better step in. You be, there better be action to that. So again, let me be clear. The problem is, isn't the action. Here's the problem. The problem is that my hope, my primary hope is put in my action. And, and it doesn't really get resolved, it doesn't really get revealed in me that I've put my primary hope in my power and my control and my ability. So often I don't even notice that I've put my hope there because most of the storms, just like these disciples, most of the storms, they navigated their way out of it. They, they shoveled the water and they moved the rudder and they dealt with the sails, but, but that's fine until we hit a storm unlike the last. And until we hit a storm, we're, wait a second, I, I, can't, I can't control the way I used to. And when those storms come, all of a sudden, the gracious conviction of the Lord reveals to us, I don't have the power for this storm. Maybe I, I, I was able to, to cover up my fear in other ways in smaller storms, but when those big storms come, um, it's not a good enough solution for them, it's not a good enough solution for us. 
Um, when storms hit us, of course, we should act and do everything in our power. If, if you get sick, uh, uh, I'm not saying don't step in and use modern medicine. If, if, if you have a job crisis, I'm not saying don't step in and use business savvy and, and best practices to problem solve and bail yourself out. But if, we make, but if we make the mistake of our doing as our primary hope, that control is our, our primary hope, well, then we're in for a rude awakening as the storms get greater and greater. I think Peter's, Peter illustrates this really well at Jesus' arrest. So they're in the garden, and Jesus is getting arrested, and, and Peter's fear takes over when he's in the garden. Right here is his rabbi, his friend, his, his messiah, his future king, and he's getting arrested. He's confused. A few days earlier, people were worshiping him as he was riding in a donkey, right? Any day now, surely he's going he's gonna to kick out Rome and set up his earthly kingdom, right? And so Peter's wrestling with all of this confusion as he's watching Jesus get arrested in the garden. Confusion sets in. He watches this betrayal. It's going to trigger his fear. And what's his primary hope in that moment? What does Peter do as he watches Jesus get arrested, right? I'll be the savior of these circumstances. I, I, I need to control these circumstances. This isn't right. This isn't good. And if fear takes over, I need to control the circumstances. Jesus needs me to take control. So he pulls out a sword and he starts swinging it, chops off a guard's ear. Jesus rebukes Peter. Jesus heals the guard. Jesus goes off with the soldiers. When storms came, Peter... Uh, his, his initial reaction was to trust his ability, right? His initial reaction in that fear is to trust his ability, his control, his sword, his strength. Trust that over following Jesus' lead. What are ways, what are ways you're looking to yourself to control the storm? Right? As, as we walk through this series, these, it's going to be an introspective series to ask the Lord, God, show me where are ways even with fear that when these storms hit that, man, I'm putting my hope and my trust in, in my own strength or I'm putting my hope and my strength and my trust in some, some worldly solution that's eventually going to let you down. What are those things? Maybe when you feel out of control with kids, right, does, it, does it elicit anger? <laughs> when your kids aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And it's not just because they're being disobedient. It's, this is going to be a pattern in their life. This is going to cost them. It becomes this, this fear, this storm. What does that elicit? Does it elicit? I can't control them. And it creates more anger. And it creates um, an attempt to control their behavior, which anybody who has kids knows that's fruitless. Right? When work gets scary, what is produced? Is it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to manipulate whatever I need to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to lead like a, like a tyrant over the people I'm supposed to be uh, serving and leading. A another whole area that we see this play out is you know, experts in the areas of eating disorders. Um, th they have taught us that many of those um, eating disorders aren't just simply about um, a desire to be a certain number on a scale, um, but really that there's this desire to exert kind of an unhealthy control over something that they can control because because so often our lives feel out of control, but at least this I can control, right? This calorie intake, this. And so they, there's all these different things that control tries to be a salve for, tries to be a Messiah and a Savior for, so that I don't have to sit in this storm any longer, and so I've got to take control of things that, that ultimately can become healthy, and they're personal things, and they're patterns that are hard to break. Fear in the storm, it produces produces that unhealthy control. And what's happening is we have a God who's telling us, can you trust me with that? He's, he's not just asking, he's telling. You can trust me with that. That's what our God is telling us. You, you can trust me with that all throughout Scripture. You can trust me with that. We can lay down that control and we can trust a God who is bigger than our circumstances. But it isn't just that response, right? That's certainly one response. There's a response that would say, um, I, I mean, I got I to gotta fix this myself. I've got to look to a worldly solution or, or solve it myself. But there's another response in storms that hit us, a, another, another wrong response. 
And that's the fear of storms, and, and they can lead us to disconnect in ways we're not designed to disconnect. Right? And I'll move quick on this one because I, I think this is intuitive. I think we, we know this. We, we see this in our own life. Um, uh, one, I, I disconnect from God at times. Right? There's a couple of ways we, we disconnect. I might, in the storm, and circumstances hit, when things are bad, when things are rough, I'm, I might say, okay, I, I got to disconnect. God, I, I, I relate to those disciples in the boat. God, I can't believe you'd let this happen. I, I can't believe you would allow this. I feel abandoned. You're asleep on a cushion, Jesus. What are you doing? I'm in this storm and I feel abandoned. And so I'll, I'll disconnect from God and already feel resolute. The outcome is determined. I've already resolved God has abandoned me before he's finished telling his story. And so I, I disconnect from God. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've, maybe you've experienced some really real hurt and pain and sitting in a storm and it doesn't seem like it's relenting and you're taking on water. It just feels like Jesus is asleep on a cushion somewhere. It's so easy. I, I relate to these disciples. I hope you do too. Easy to disconnect. Say, God, you've abandoned me and yet he is there. And yet as we watch the story play out, he is there. He, he will exert his control. He will finish what he started on this side of eternity or the next. His promises will be kept. The other way, though, is not just a, I might disconnect from God, but I just would disconnect from reality. So often in our culture, we will just numb ourselves, and we've become just masters of being able to numb ourselves. We veg, we binge watch, we shop, we scroll we, we work or we fill our calendars so full. I fill my calendar so packed that, that then I don't have room to be afraid. Right? I don't have room to feel those feelings or process the storm because I'm so busy or I'm so checked out. or I'll, I'll, just, I'll just cope in, in unhealthy ways. How do you disconnect? This morning, I want to challenge you. Be, be praying as, as you hear this sermon, how, how, are, how do you disconnect from reality? What are those go-to ways? Um, what allows you to avoid fear altogether? Because the goal is not to avoid fear. That's not the goal. The goal is not how do I not have fear, even biblically. I'm not going to provide a solution that says, hey, look, if we, if we go this route, now we won't experience fear. The goal is not to not have fear. The goal is to focus our fear in the right direction. Let me repeat that. Your ability to endure the storms is not contingent on your ability to avoid all fear. It's not contingent on the absence of fear. It's contingent on where you focus your fear. Look back at verse 40 and verse 41. Jesus, after he's just calmed the storm, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were, what? Filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Do you see what happens? Do you, do you see what happens? All of a sudden, their fear is the storm, it's the waves, it's the circumstances around them. And then Jesus flexes and all of a sudden, their fear shifts in the text, it says, wait a second. Who is this? This one in the boat with us, he is, he is more powerful than we possibly could have imagined. Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is what realigns you to the only consistent hope you have in the storm. Right? And so we go from fear of the storm to refocusing it is fear of the Lord. It's a, it's a command that God has made pretty clear all throughout Scripture. Fear of the Lord is a, a common command from God. right? So, so it's not that we shouldn't have fear. It's that we should have a proper fear. And having that proper fear changes and diffuses fear of, of circumstances that can become unhealthy. right? I mean, fear of the Lord, I think so often that term, fear of the Lord, I know when I was 
Um, I, I've struggled with that at times, thinking, man, that, we have such a kind of Western, you know, understanding at times. I mean, Jesus is our BFF, and he's our homeboy, and he's our co-pilot, and all of these things. And this idea of fear of the Lord, I, at times, some of us, depending on maybe what denomination we grew up in, maybe that's more difficult for us to wrap our minds around, and, and some of you get that easily. Um, God of Scripture, he, he calls us to, to fear him. Uh, he calls us to fear him in and in doing that, it's going to diminish other things. In Proverbs 1, he says the fear of the Lord is actually the beginning of knowledge. In Proverbs 14, we see the fear of the Lord is the fountain of life. It's all these incredible benefits. In, in Proverbs, the end of Proverbs 14, he says again the fear of the Lord, but he talks about it being a strong confidence and a refuge for our children when we fear the Lord with confidence. Fear of the Lord seems like it, it might be this distancing thing from God, but we have to flip the script on that. Right? Friendship with God is found through a healthy fear of him. Psalm 25, 14, the psalmist says, The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. Friendship is found through my, my fear. And, and Hebrews eleven seven actually helps us even understand and define that a little better, even as it talks about Noah uh, in, in eleven seven, It says, By faith, Noah... Being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his family. And so we see this reverence, we see this awe throughout our, our call uh, to fear him. It's a trust that he is who he said he is. And I respect that and I see him for the powerful God that he is. And this wasn't just an Old Testament thing. This was a New Testament thing also. It wasn't just a pre-Jesus and, and now on Jesus. We don't have to do that anymore. No, in Acts 9.31, at the beginning of the church, when it's growing, it says, so the church throughout all Judea and, Gal and Galilee and Samaria, Samaria had peace and was being built up. And then listen, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. What a beautiful tension that produces growth. The fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Those, that tension produced the growth of the New Testament church. He's powerful, but he's also comforting. The disciples, um, they, they realized that they were, they were focused on the power of the waves and they didn't, they didn't understand or appreciate the power of the one who was in the boat with him. That he was greater, right? A modern day example, if I can, would be just picture yourself on a plane. And the plane's going down and the oxygen masks have fallen and the, the pilot's saying brace for impact and you got luggage falling out of the, the thing and you got babies crying and you got loved ones calling loved ones and, and, it, and it's gnarly and you're sitting there and, and you panic and you look to your left and the guy sitting next to you is asleep. Neck pillow, just conked out, Right? Maybe he's got ear pods on, and he's just conked out, and there's you know, people crying and saying goodbye, and right, you look out the window, and it's getting shaky in a storm, and you, eventually you just are annoyed by the guy with the neck, he's kind of snoring loudly, and you nudge him, hey man, do you want to call somebody? We're about to, if you want to call somebody, now is your chance, we're, we're about to die, and, and he wakes up, he just says, quiet, plane levels, storm stops. Right? If that was you, your fear would go, okay, all the circumstances, the storm, the windows, the, the luggage, the crime, all of a sudden, your reverence and your fear would be, who am I sitting next to? Right? Who is this? You would watch that guy to the baggage claim. You would, I mean, who is this guy? <laughs> There's power in that. So now in the light of all of those things, Right in the, in the light of these, these default settings that we have, in the light of this solution to our fear, not being just, just avoid it, just, just don't ever have any, but, but instead place it in the right, powerful Savior that we have. Um, I want us to kind of walk through this, this reordering that we've been talking through in this series of our identity, which, which then leads to a renewed mind, which then produces feelings in our life. And we start with I am the I am's, right? I, I am a child of the most powerful king. That's a truth that should define our identity as a, as a believer. Romans 8, 14 through 16, this is what Paul says. 
to the Roman church. He says, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Man, I love those verses, right? As a new creation in Christ, you have received a spirit that says we are free from a spirit of bondage and fear, and we now have a spirit of adoption, right? It attaches us as adopted kids to this awe, this awesome God, this this God that should fill us with awe, and we are attached as as sons, And and Paul uses that word son intentionally, not to leave out ladies, but to say everyone, men and women, are sons because he he ties it in later to being a co-heir. Right? And, and in this culture, at this time, only the sons got the inheritance. And so he's making it very clear, everyone who believes is going to be a, a full heir with the king of the universe. Right? A, a father and their kids. Two things I hope we see and I hope we apply from, from this identity that, that it should produce in us. One is just that, that it is our identity. That we walk in that. I hope we don't miss out on the confidence that that we can have as being a child of the king. Not because we earned it, but because of the gospel. We, we get to be a child of the king. Gives us freedom and belonging, even in the toughest storms. But here's the second thing I don't want us to miss in this is, um, I hope we don't miss what a witness this is to the world around us. Right? This reality and this truth, we are called to be a witness. Right? The world is looking at us. Right, the world is watching for where we put our confidence. And our society has tried everything for their confidence and their authority has been in morality, it's been in science. Now most of our society and culture would just say, well, our authority is in our feelings and whatever we want and it's shifting. But we can model confidence as believers through storms that the world can see and and say, who is their hope in? Who is their rock in? What, what solution have they found to give them a, a peace in the midst of this crazy brokenness? In the midst of those hard circumstances? In the midst of those horrible storms? We point to a Savior in, in the boat with us as our hope. And the world watches us do that. And that's easier said than done. But when we walk out of here and the storms are raging in our culture and in our life, we, we want to... Who do we trust? Do we trust in ourselves? Do we trust in worldly solutions as temporary fixes? I hope not. And just as a a real practical application, I don't know if you guys knew this or not, this is an election year. So, right, our, our culture, I mean, I already mentioned it, raising boys, raising kids in our culture right now is scary. It's broken if you've been paying attention. It's re- and here's another election that, man, our, our country and our culture is hanging in the balance. This is important. This is important. Right? We've been, we've been given an opportunity. If we're American citizens here and we call this our home, then we've been given an opportunity to have a voice. And we should follow those convictions. Please hear me say, we should follow biblical convictions. We should vote. We, we should advocate we should step into to, to, to our culture. Uh, we should fight for, for things. We should fight for what's best. But while we do that, while we walk in our convictions, especially in an election year, let's be really, really careful that our witness is not pointing to those things as our Savior. That it's very clear to the world around you that as you move forward in your convictions this year and, and make the decisions you do and advocate appropriately and biblically, that, that it's very clear to the world that your hope is not in, in some election, some politician, some new policy, that, that we move and we activate and we serve and we, we step into culture, but we step into culture as one who we know where our hope is, right? We know who's in the boat with us and that we're not confusing the world around us by pointing to this person or that person or this policy or this thing. We're pointing to Jesus, and there's no mistake. Jesus is where our hope is. And man, it, when, when I preach, um, whether it's 
here or certainly when I'm preaching at Renovate, which is our young adult ministry or our college outreach over by TCU, you better believe and, and very well-intentioned and rightfully so. I wouldn't have it any other way. People who love me say, man, you gotta, you gotta speak into this. You gotta get real practical on this politician. Give this a head nod. Talk about this policy. And, and those are all things that I, I'm gonna have personal convictions on that I need to step out and be obedient. But you better believe we're gonna, we're gonna make this pulpit something that points to Jesus constantly. There's no confusion of who we point to as our hope for the crazy storms we have. And in your life too, it's so clear, your hope is the one who's in the boat with you. Run hard, be an advocate, fight for what's best. Don't be passive, but make sure it's not confusing of who your Savior is. Um, I think... We have this I am of who we are in, in Christ, that we're children of God, and this incredible opportunity to, to be a, a testimony of what that means and the, the security and the peace that we can have amidst awful circumstances, no matter what they are. But also then that identity then shapes our thoughts, right? I think about God's power over all things. It becomes this application for me to say, okay, I am a child of God, and so now I, I think about the things of God, his power, my identity as an adopted son, it translates to my thoughts of his power, not my own. I love the story in Exodus. In Exodus 3, uh, verses 11 and 12, uh, God has called Moses to go set, set his captives free. And in verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of, of Israel out of Egypt? And then God says, he said, but I will be with you and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Did you see that? I love what God did there. Moses says, God, I don't think I'm the right guy. I'm not good. I'm not, I can't do this. I'm not a good enough leader. I'm not strong enough. I'm not gifted enough. You know what God says? Does he say, no, you're great, Moses. You're so good and strong. No, he says, you're right. I, yeah, it has nothing to do with you. It's my strength. When Moses says, I don't have it, God isn't like, no. He, God is like, yep, I will be there. I am the strength. I am the one. That's who we think about, his power. Uh, Ephesians 3, 2, his power that, that him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think according to the power at work. with We can't even imagine how powerful he is. And so we know we're a child of God, and then we get to think about the power of that God the father that we have and how powerful he is. And, and as our mind starts to be trained and renewed day by day, slowly, God, help me to think, right? So often I can head, nod my head to, yes, I'm a child of God, I'm, I'm his. But then I, I don't train my mind to think about what that comes with. I'm his, In his power. I can't even imagine all of it. And so I think on those things. When I think on those things, it, it will produce worship in my heart. And then what does it do? It produces these feelings. I feel secure knowing God is in control. Right? That feeling of security comes as a response to a renewed mind that comes from an adoption by the Holy Spirit that I get to cry out, Abba, Father, to an incredibly powerful, omniscient, omnipotent God. I feel secure in the midst of the storms. There is this healthy fear that I can feel secure. Psalmist in Psalm 23, 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We're comforted. What amazing promise we have through Christ. Amazing promises, right? It's a, it's a promise. Church, it's a promise that supersedes the storm. Whatever storm is in your life, it comes with all the fear, the promise of God supersedes that. I got one final observation for you. <clears throat> one final observation, and then we'll go back to responding in worship, um, is this. I'm, I'm not a fire and brimstone guy. That's not my style. That's not our church's style. But what is our style is to love you well enough to speak truth into your life. And so all those promises, that reality, the freedom that we can have from fear, the confidence, the adoption we have for a holy God, if you have not placed your faith in Jesus, right? If you've come to church and you do good things and you like Jesus and you'd vote for Jesus if he was running and, and you affirm maybe even Christianity, right? But you've never surrendered your life, you've never put your faith in Jesus, if you've never done that, 
we love you enough to tell you that all those application points, the beautiful freedom we just talked about, it doesn't apply to you. It doesn't apply to you. The, the freedom that comes from knowing Christ and, and, and not trying to strive to do it and to be good enough, but the freedom that comes from surrendering is Galatians 2.20, Paul says, for I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives within me. And the life with Ch I now live in the flesh, I live in faith in the one who loved me and gave himself up for me. That reality of surrender, if that hasn't happened in your life, then, then you are on sinking sand. You, you are grasping for things. Then, then you are just looking for an emotional crutch. Maybe you'll hear a good sermon or hear some good worship songs or get in a good Christian community. But if you don't have the spirit of God that comes at faith, then then. I, we love you enough to tell you those promises aren't for you. And I don't say that to scare you. I say that to invite you. I say that to invite you. Come. You have a God who maybe you've been searching for and looking for and trying to get to. And he has been standing in front of you saying, just come. I'm in the boat with you. Would you surrender? Would you put your faith in me? And you say, but I don't have all the answers and I still got questions. Good. Good. Ask your questions. But trust the God that you sit before. I still have questions. But my relationship isn't built on having all the answers. It's built on a God who I trust, who's real, who's moving and active, and who sent his son to die for me and to die for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for how you love us. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your grace, God, your incredible grace through Jesus. Lord, would we be people who... Um, would focus our eyes on you, Lord, in the midst of our storms, that, in the midst of fear that wants to take over, would we be uh, a people who, who you, through the graciousness of your Holy Spirit, would help us fix our eyes on your goodness, on your power, but also through Christ and Christ alone, through your approachability, that we are yours and you are ours. Help us, Lord. Help us see you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Church, will you stand and sing with us? the way
waves and wind still know his name. So let go my soul and trust in him. The waves and wind still know his name. The waves and wind still know.
never fail. Now, church, I hope that you have witnessed it. I hope you've witnessed and leave here encouraged by who God is and how he showed up in your life. And, and if you haven't, and if you're looking for that, and if you need other people around you to remind you, then that's what the body of Christ is for. And there'll be some ministers, some men, and some women right outside these doors. They'd love to walk with you. Any next steps, you've got questions, you just need encouragement, you want to figure out how you can walk this thing out or get more plugged in, you name it. There's some people who love Jesus outside those doors at the desk. Go and talk to them uh, about any next steps that you feel like maybe the Holy Spirit is tugging on you for. And then also, if you need prayer, want prayer, we'll be down front. We'd love to pray for you. We love you guys. God bless you. Have a good one.
We're so glad you joined in today and look forward to being together again next Sunday. Before you go, I hope you'll let us know how we can pray for you. If there's anything big or small you'd like us to pray for today and throughout the week. You can also call or text me if anything comes up we can be praying for and if you have any questions. We hope you all have an incredible week and we'll see you next Sunday.